Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Living with Parkinson's Meetup. I'm Chris Kruger, Program Manager for Educational Content with the Davis Finney Foundation. And uh, like our panelists, I, too, live with Parkinson's. I was diagnosed in uh, 2020, and I'm really excited to be here. Before we get started uh, today, because we're going to be talking about changes in ability that come with Parkinson's and because we might talk about some things that we uh, on the panel no longer do, I thought I'd ask our panelists today when they introduce themselves to do something that might be a little uncomfortable, and I hope they don't mind, uh, and say something that they 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 think they're they're good at, or maybe that their family thinks they're good at, um, maybe even something like a superpower. I asked my partner what mine was, and she said that I can travel plan like the best of them. So I, I, I <laughs> she thinks I'm a great researcher for that, and and I I think I might agree. Um, so. Um, I guess we're gonna we're gonna start off with some introductions and, and a little bit of superpower talk, and maybe I'll I'll ask uh, Christy if she can start us off. Hey everyone, I'm Christy Delanica. I live in Troy, New York. Um, I've been diagnosed since I was 40, um, so I have had Parkinson's for four years, but I know it was much longer um, when I look at the symptoms. And I think that my superpower is that I have the ability to remember crazy details. I don't know how, but I can always remember details and I can always remember faces. Except for today, I can't remember to take my meds on time. So, but whatever, but details. <laughs> okay, and Kat, how about you uh, You go next, please? Um, I just want to say I'm really grateful for Christy's superpower because I call on it often. <laughs> um, let's see, what is my superpower? I would say that I'm patient, um, that I... I'm patient. I th I think I would, uh, I waited on a lot of babies to get here in my career. So I've gotten good at just sitting and being. So. I rely on you to smooth over interactions and other meetings <laughs> with your patients because I'm not patient. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thanks, Christy. Uh, all right, Kevin, you're next on my screen. So what, what about you? Well, this discussion of superpowers makes me think about a 1980s show uh, where there were these superheroes, and this is the superhero I want to be for. Um, <laughs> handyman. Handyman. Handyman, that's right. I want to be handyman when I grow up. His weakness was Cripple Night. <laughs> it's the most irreverent show in the world. And so, but uh, handyman is uh, the thing that we all talk about in the gym when we're working out. Uh, um, so my superpower, in addition to yearning to be a handyman, is to is I I think I, I I've developed a good sense of, of empathy and active listening. Um, people get really annoyed with me because I listen and then I tend to ask, ask really probing questions. Awesome. And, and they say it's very disarming. <laughs> Well, I that and your good looks, Kev. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said that and your good looks are a little uh, different. <laughs> okay, so Robin, how about, how about you're up, please? Okay, I don't know. Um, I'm freezing for some reason. Um, my superpower is I have the ability to kind of, because of my job, I have the ability to see through what's happening with someone and kind of get right to the heart of it. And I know what to bring empathetically to a situation to help someone move to whatever the next level is. Almost like a really good therapist. Great. Thanks. Or for bartender. Sharing. Or bartender, that too. <laughs> Amber, how about you? Uh, you go next, please. So I asked my friends and they said my wit or ability to use dark humor to cope with situations. <laughs> <Yes. the situation. laughs> Great. And uh, Doug, you're next on my screen. How about you? Doug Reed, Colin from Lafayette, Colorado, diagnosed uh, in 2010. Um, one of my best friends, I've known him for over 30 years, calls me the master of the side comment. So I guess that means I have a quick wit and a good sense of humor. All right. And Tom, you're next on my screen. How about you? 
Uh, I'm, I'm first of all, I'm glad to be back. It's been a crazy year. Back on, back on all four feet, and I think I'm doing okay. Uh, that said, my name is Tom Polizzi. I'm from Arvada, Colorado, just outside of Louisville, or between Louisville and Denver. And I think my superpower is I can pretty much fix anything. I don't know why. I just uh, have this uncanny knack to to fix stuff. In fact, when COVID was going on, I'd fixed everything that was broken. I had to start breaking things so I'd have something to do. So <laughs> it's good to be back. We'd love to have you visit up our way anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have you back, Tom. Yeah, Thanks, Tom, guys. great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Brian, how about you? What's your superpower? Um, at my best, my superpower has been my optimism. Uh, and recently, I've been getting much better at being back at that. I was told that I might have to have back surgery, and the back surgeons, all three of them, said, you'll never be 100% again. So I wrote my friends. I said, this is super cool. I'm going to be like 120%. It's going to get better and better. <laughs> so that's my crazy <laughs> optimism. <laughs> all right, Heather, tell, how about you? You got a superpower for us? Brian also has humor because he sent me a message said that I could see his labs and it was a picture of a couple of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. My superpower is being cattle today because I can never <laughs> find the link in time. So I'm really lucky to be patient for once in my life because patience is not my forte. I think one of my superpowers is just making goofy situations happen. Like I'm excellent at sight gags. If you ever need some comic relief, like, you know, the wingman who falls all over everybody and then disappears from the scene, I'm your girl. Let's do it. So just know in the chat that that it may be from me or it may be from Heather. So uh, that's my disclaimer for all the keep people we do today. <laughs> Keeping them on their toes. We're really punchy today, guys. Like, <laughs> uh, out of control already. <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to get us started on our topic for today, but I also want to invite the, the, the audience, please, if you have a superpower, you know, let us know in the chat, like, fill it in there. Um, today, we're going to talk about changes in ability that are brought on by Parkinson's, uh, including the ways that Parkinson's might be overtly disabling. Um, Parkinson's can change abilities in a lot of different ways. Uh, it can affect our ability to exercise or drive or our ability to walk or move at all. Uh, it can affect the ability to access things, places we want to go. It can affect our ability to talk and write and change our ability to communicate in a lot of ways. Um, I'm going to pass this off to Christy to get us started talking about what changes in ability the panelists have faced and how they're navigating these changes or how they've navigated them in the past. And um, you know, please please don't forget that uh, we welcome your questions in the chat. So let us know if if there's anything we can address that you're wondering about. So Christy, can you take us off? So I want to kind of start off with um, talking about imposter syndrome and disability. So I was thinking about this when I was when I use my um hang tag, my handicap hang tag. I don't know if anyone else feels like this, but when I use my hang tag, I always feel guilty when I'm parking in a handicap spot if I can walk normally. I don't know why. I feel like people are judging me and looking at me, and that because I can walk at that point in time, but I can't guarantee if I can walk normally in about 10, 15 minutes. So does anyone have any other examples to share of how they navigate those types of situations? Kevin. Yeah, Chris, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. And it's been a bit of a journey for me on uh, it, really the admission of disability in general. You know, when you're early on in your disease, you tend to say, I can get through this. I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm not, I'm doing fine. Right. What, what you find over time is that the, the efforts that we have to do things uh, become more challenging. And I want to talk about an example with, I, I got together uh, with a group of three, 360 disabled people the other day up in Breckenridge at this conference called No Barriers. No Barriers is, is an event which brings people with huge disabilities. It was founded by a climber who climbed Mount Everest blind 20 years ago. And he holds this conference where he brings people together. And there were some people in that conference that were hugely obvious. I mean, they had shrapnel, you know, from 
bomb blasts or we had people that were blind or, or very obvious individuals. But a group of us were together where our disabilities were a little more invisible. And we talked a lot about imposter syndrome. Uh, and these individuals were all um, people that had PTSD or things like diseases where you couldn't see all the things that were happening. And what was really nice about this weekend was it was not a competition to say whose disability was greater, but it was really celebrating the fact that we all had something that was challenging us. And we all lifted each other up through that event. And so, as I first of all, I didn't use my disability placard when I was at this event because there were people that really needed the parking spots. Um, but what I would say is that we are all ambassadors of both Parkinson's and this uh, disability that we have. And if you get out of your car and someone questions you, you're representing all the all of our population and tribe here. So I went, I've got kind of gone from that embarrassment of using the placard to now almost wearing it as a symbol of pride in some way. So that's my two cents on, on the on the imposter syndrome. I, I'd be curious to hear what other people say. Me too. That's a great perspective, Robin. Mm -hmm. I talk about cycling all the time but I cycle with groups of people who go fast and I wasn't able to keep up with them anymore, even at a most basic pace. So I use an electric assist bike and it looks like, I mean, I just almost feel the need to explain myself every single time I'm on a group ride and it's like outing myself. But, you know, if I didn't have an electric assist bike, my average speed would be eight miles an hour. So that's just one of those things where, I always feel the need to explain myself. Yeah, it, it can it certainly be an uncomfortable feeling, I think, sometimes, because people will look at you um, kind of uh, you know, making comments, I'm sure, in their heads about, that guy doesn't look disabled to me. But um, again, you know, I, I never know how I'm, I may enter a building walking and I may walk out of the building or crawl out of the building on my way out. So you never know what's going to happen. That's why I don't, I, I really don't let it, I don't really worry about it. So I, I haven't ever given it much thought. The only time it becomes really dangerous is if you're heading into an emergency department and they don't think that you're disabled or they don't realize your specific health needs because of how you initially appear in terms of being really dangerous for us anyway. But I have found in parking places, there's an awful lot of people who have an awful lot of opinions. And I used to be one of them. That's the thing. We don't know until we know. So I can't get too mad at them because they just don't know yet. Maybe they'll never know. I hope they don't, but. You I never had a, a, a handicap. You have struggled a lot lately on this topic of, of finding yourself in a situation, having to explain yourself. Uh, to me, that's one of the hardest things when we're going through this sort of survival. I just want to get through this. And trying to teach someone as a learn teaching experience, sometimes we just don't have the patience to do that. I have a funny story, though. Please. On that note. Christy, not to change the subject completely from parking, but it does have to do with transportation. It's a okay. Please share. I found another of my superpowers happens to be the quadrant roundabouts you go through in an airport. Where picture this, we're moving as a school of fish, where if the person stops abruptly right in front of you, you will fall. Mm -hmm. And the, the access doors are all locked on either side. So I had to go through the turnstile revolving door. Froze in there for at least a minute. <laughs> Everybody hits the glass. And they were like, man down, terminal three. El oh, elderly couple down, terminal three. It's ma'am, security to terminal three. Get over to the quadrant immediately. And you could hear this on the loudspeaker. They're calling security. It was a pileup. Who caused it? Me. So I'm sitting there getting the side eye. 
everybody's looking at me. I'm going, I, I can't. They're like, why didn't you just move out of the way? I go, ha, ha, I don't know. I froze. I completely froze. And then pretty soon, everyone is just livid with me. And I, I, I went, Parkinson's? <laughs> Only word I could get out. And that actually happened. Anyway, security knows me now. <laughs> We're like this. He's back. <laughs> hey, Doug. The only time I've experienced imposter syndrome was pretty recently when I was on vacation and in the airport and I got a wheelchair and I loved the wheelchair mm -hmm. experience to the point that I think I'm going to request a wheelchair every time I fly. Uh, not, and for those of you that are regular attendees to this meeting, you probably know I broke my leg in March and I had bunion surgery last month. So I've been having a tough time of it, but I decided when people are looking at me, this relatively young guy riding in a chair, I decided I'm going to wear my Davis Finney t-shirts when I there travel and just advertise that I have Parkinson's. Beautiful. And yeah. when, I, when I meet new people, it's one of the first things out of my mouth after I've shook hands or uh, had the greetings. I just want people to know I've been living with this disease for over 13 years yeah. now. I almost have a sense of pride about it. So when we went to WBC, I got the um I got a wheelchair myself to for um when we landed in Chicago on our layover there. Did you how did you feel being in the wheelchair? Did you feel invisible like going through the airport or did you feel that people saw you? I felt very invisible. I felt like people were looking at me. I agree with Doug. I got the wheelchair on my first trip to WPC. On the way over there, I used it to get on to the plane to Barcelona, but on the way back, I had to use it for all of them. Um, and I felt like, yeah, people are definitely starting to see somebody young on a wheelchair and it looks like I'm completely able and I was not. <laughs> it, it's, it's difficult, I find when, I, when we're traveling. And I, I use a wheelchair almost exclusively these days, um, especially like if we're traveling at odd hours, like early in the morning or late in the evening. And um, it, it helps. Uh, I don't feel like people, I don't feel invisible. I have to laugh at the guys who are pushing the wheelchair who kind of make a lot of noise or ring the bell or whatever to signal that we're coming and that kind of thing. But uh, it's definitely it's definitely worthwhile. And I, I got to say, I, I don't really mind if people see me. I think it's a good thing. I've never, no one's ever asked or made a comment to me at all so far. So uh, I did have one instance when I froze putting my bag up in the uh, bin and I just couldn't move. And this guy's looking at me thinking I was staring at him. And I'm like, no, I'm not staring at you. And then he got up and, and said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I have Parkinson's. I can't, I can't move. And he took my bag and he put it up there for me. So again, I think the guys that have all mentioned this so far, all of you folks that have mentioned it so far about it, being a, a, a teaching a, a opportunity, is that, that's how I look at it, and it works pretty well. Yep, Karen? Um, I, yeah, and I, I agree with everybody about getting the wheelchair I did to Barcelona when it was suggested, and the standing that we would have had to have done in the lines going through uh, to get in country would have been insane. Um, so yeah, I can walk, you know, a mile without too much problem. Sometimes I'll look funny, but um, the the whole idea is we have to take care of ourselves for the long run. And if we walk and we hurt ourselves, we're we're not helping that uh, goal. Um, and one thing when you said imposter syndrome, and this is about Parkinson's, and it's it addresses um, our times when we're bad and when we're not. But when I was still teaching and I had Parkinson's, I'd go through the school and I was just like hunched over and I had a cane and I just had all the stress on me. And then I was out shopping at Costco with Lily and a teacher commented to her kids one day that, oh, I think Mr. Reed is faking it. He just walks around here like this and then he's at Costco and he's fine. And it's like, <laughs> you know, there's the pressure and the stress, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then you get home and you're with the most gorgeous woman you love. Of course, you're going to start to feel better and you're going to relax. And then you go out and you're just getting a few things. So I had to kind of explain that to her. But that's the thing with Parkinson's is we don't know when we're going to need it. And sometimes we're just crapped out. And other times we're amazing. And 
Yeah, explaining that to people isn't that easy, but it, it gets comments in other ways. I thought for people who work, they might have some of that to address. You know, I know the purpose of this talk today is not really to discuss some of the more technical issues of what disability means. But one thing that brought me great pleasure in 2016 was when the Parkinson's Action Network lobbied to make non-motor symptoms recognized by Social Security. That was a big wow. deal for all of us. And I think what's happening is there's still catch up. Patients themselves, uh, employers, and the whole environment is catching up with the recognition that the non-motor symptoms are in fact a disability. Yeah, Kevin, I would really echo that, that, that because in terms of quality of life, I don't know about all of you, but it's, it's often the non-motor symptoms that are the most impactful for me. And, and some of the more, um, the, the, what's the word we're using? The, the in, uh, invisible to many people, um, including my wonderful, loving husband. Many of you know him. He's, he's, a wonderful, empathetic, great man. And he still sometimes will say, I'll say, honey, I really want us to park in the handicap, mainly because I'm tired and it's the same thing. And then you have to go in and now, especially Costco. I don't, I think it's because the parking lots are huge and then you get inside and there's so much stimulation and so many choices. Um, so it's, yeah. it's almost always a, um, I walk in usually looking pretty okay and feeling pretty okay, but I know by the time I leave, I'm not going to be. And then to navigate a busy parking lot, um, it's complicated. And so I, I've, he's, I've had to say to him, Ken, I don't really want to explain every time I, but I'd love for you to ask. And I'd love for you just to assume that if I'm with you at Costco, that I'm going to want to part in the handicap. And if I'm having to explain to somebody who sees me day in and day out, you can imagine what the rest of the world's like, who doesn't have Parkinson's in their world. So I think it's, um, I think it's interesting and it's reinforcing that nobody else is in our bodies or in our brains. And even when we think we're presenting symptomatically, um, I loved the quote uh, Pam uh, wrote in the, in the chat over here, what other people think of us is none of our business. Exactly. And, and I try to go to this place, like, who am I to think that anybody's trying to figure me out? You know, who I'm not so special, right? I, I try to think about not having so much of an ego because often we're all looking at each other from our own places. And so I try to remember that, that, that even though I feel self-conscious or whatever, everybody's carrying their own load and it's really none of my business what people are thinking. And frankly, if I can't figure out my husband who I love and have lived with for 35 years, I'm often wrong trying to guess what he's thinking. I certainly can't figure out the whole world in a parking lot or Costco, right? So, or an airport or anyway, for what it's worth. Robin. Well, sort of cutting back the other direction, you know, one of the things I, my mom has got diagnosed with Parkinson's after I did. And I feel like on this panel, most of our panelists that were really good about talking about adjusting expectations. And, uh, you know, last month we were talking about, um, you know, me being a maverick and having to sort of downscale certain activities. But I have had interactions with my mom and she's having a hard time accepting that the outside version of her does not match the version that she has in her head. And she has put herself in very dangerous situations, not riding on an expressway, but um, that resulted in a fall and a broken bone, which could be the first domino to tip in a slow motion catastrophe. And there is this sort of, my brother and I had a come to Jesus moment with her because we're like, you have got to stop minimizing our suggestions and rolling your eyes and sort of saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm going to do what I always could do. I, you know, I don't want to be different. And she ended up having an experience. I'll email it to the panelists. It, it can't go public, but I'll email it to the panelists. She wrote a story about it where 
she decided, you know, she was going to go to the dentist without any help at all. And she had an eye opening experience with it. And so on the reverse side, there's this idea about what we talked about last month, sort of really adjusting our expectations of ourselves based on the physical realities versus having an overblown idea of what we have in our head and that, you know, my mom isn't her 35 year old self. And it, it's interesting to, for me to be interacting with someone. I mean, in some ways I feel like I accept my Parkinson's more than my mom accepts hers. And that creates a very different safety situation and a very different practice very different practical considerations. Yeah, Robin, you're pointing to something interesting to me that I think we've kind of circled around but haven't really dialed in on, which is, you know, we've talked about some practical difficulties um, that are significant, obviously, but there's also kind of uh, deeper emotional and, and familial um, issues that arise out of, out of changes in ability that have to be navigated. So I'm wondering if anybody has any perspective on I mean, Kat's talked about it a little bit and, and and Doug maybe has talked about it a little bit, but just the emotional side, you know, how do we deal with these things internally? Somebody was talking about patience as their superpower. And, um, and I would just wonder, how do we create that? How do we find that inner strength? Does anybody have any thoughts about the emotional side and how we find strength? Well, it's, it's kind of the denial and the acceptance thing. And, and I know when I first got it, I was in denial for a long time and when I used to do presentations, I and I realized I had been in denial. I put up a picture of the Nile River and I say, not that Nile, I'm in <laughs> denial, denial. But it's um, something that I think we all kind of inherit in the sense of we're young and vital and we have this thing that we can't see. And so we have like, oh, no, I can still do this. Oh, I can do that. Oh, damn, that was a catastrophe. And I'm still having to renavigate. Well, now being living alone, it's it's tougher because I don't have somebody to say, hey, that's stupid for you um, or, you know, something, but guidance. Um, but it is truly the biggest challenge I think we have because we want to remain vital. And I think it's an ongoing thing, at least in my end. Uh, it's it's something where I have to get humbled sometimes to get it in. Yeah. Kevin's been Can great. I ask the panel here? Has, have any of you ever taken a functional capabilities exam? Uh, my, my, my disability lawyer recommended that I do it. And I went in to work with this uh, occupational therapist for four hours doing all kinds of tests, lifting, fine motor skills, you name it. And... Um, at the end, it was a very teary session where she says, you are definitely disabled mm -hmm. according to my criteria. Mm. But she went on to say that just because you're disabled for something like a work evaluation, you're not dis disabled socially and living life. She says, those are two separate dis disabilities that we're dealing with. And so I think it's, it's really important to sort of disassociate what is your physical disability versus a, an emotional disability? Yeah, Kat, uh, is it okay if I jump in? I don't want yeah, to take jump in. Um, I think that that I'd, I've been talking to a lot of folks lately about the process of going through um, qualifying for social security disability. And it's it's quite a process and we're not experts here on this panel, but but I'd like to talk about the mixed feeling when you're awarded Social Security disability. Part of you wants to jump up and down and say, thank goodness that is over. Thank goodness I have some um, uh, promise of at least some income for the rest of my life. I may have been giving up my job. But it's also a really hard thing to say mm -hmm. that people have dubbed you or granted you disability because it can be a real catch-22 in your own head. The story that we tell ourselves is the most important story we're ever going to tell. And I think that 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 while I think it's important to grieve the losses that we have as physically things become more and more challenging, um, 
that's really important. And I think it's, it's important that we can look at ourselves honestly in the mirror and not put ourselves at risk. I think those are hard, hard things. And I think that we undervalue how hard it is to shift and, and not put ourselves in a box, even though we can use the handicap placard. And I think that that the trap is saying that when we are disabled or dubbed disabled or awarded disability, right, that 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 can that takes away our vitality and our and our all of our abilities. And so I think it's really difficult. I agree with you, Kevin, that Kevin just commented that that for me, it, it was harder. The day that I was awarded social security disability was one of the hardest days of my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, Mine too. It was, uh, oh, I'm going to choke up. <laughs> it was um, validating in some ways, but it was also such a huge loss because I loved my work. And I knew that it was safer for me to not practice midwifery anymore for a whole host of reasons, but it was such a huge loss for me. And I really thought that professionally and intellectually, it would, my life was over in many ways. And I'm so grateful that it isn't, that I've been able to go on and redefine myself, but I, but I get how hard that is. And, um, and I don't want us to downplay that because I think it is the single hardest part about living with a disability and also being diagnosed at a time when you're not ready to leave your professional life. And economically, it has so significant of impacts. Impact, that, sorry. That is so powerful, Kat. And now you're helping mm -hmm. lots of other people. You're helping so many of us. You've helped me basically birth something. <laughs> you look at you. You're just, you don't stop helping. So thanks. Well, thank yeah, you. Kat. Sorry to be a mush pot. Don't be sorry. <laughs> no. Amber, Kat, well, Kat, I... and you bring up such an important point because I think particularly for this panel, we're all of personality types that we identify a lot with our jobs, our careers, and what we do. And it force it's forcing me that you talked about finding vitality other ways, redefining ourselves. It's sort of like a spiritual journey of unlatching your identity from the externals <laughs> and finding, you know, joy just in relating to people or in our hobbies or whatever it may be. Um, that's not an easy task. That's not an easy journey. I think, Kat, so often on these webinars, you always talk about this as a human experience. And I do think that we all have these spiritual journeys of, you know, growth. And this is one of them. And there's the grieving process. I've heard people talk about that all the time, especially in this environment about grieving the loss of your job or your career or whatever. I mean, that's that's certainly a real thing by all means. And I know I felt very similar to Kat. Well, my job wasn't anywhere near as glorious as yours, but it was definitely a, a, a costly thing for me mentally. I think what, what helps on the other side of the coin, though, is um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a business-like decision that you make there. It's, for me, it was... Um, assuring myself that I had affordable insurance for the rest of, uh, for a long period of time. And that's, was really the big reason I, I sought social security disability. Plus there was pressure from the private insurer that supplies the, uh, both of my disability to get that, that, that alleviates some money that they have to kick in. But the money aside, it was really more about having the security of, of having some decent insurance at, at a reasonable cost. So there's some good business things that if you focus on those, it might help the process of uh, carrying that label of being disabled. Has anyone on this panel um, been denied insurance because they didn't file properly for their disability? Oh, well, Amber had a comment first. So she had her hand up for a while. Oh, sorry. I was just going to echo what Kat was saying. Um, I recently attended a Social Security Administration 
uh, seminar. And, you know, I'm still working full time. I'm a single mom. So I have to think about monetarily being able to provide for the kids and, you know, insurance and all of that. But I had basically a full down breakdown thinking about not going to work. Like, I feel like that is my identity and that's the escape from my house. And because I don't have a partner here at home, that's really how I get out and socialize. And what would that do if I didn't have that? Like, so can I just work forever? <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep you busy here, Amber. <laughs> and my job has to change so I can work forever though, because yes, yes. Kind of like on, on the, on the other hand, it's thinking about having to go to work and teach how long can I actually physically do this? Sorry, Heather, mm -hmm. I'll call you in a second. Like, how long can I physically do this before I'm going to have to apply? And I, that's I why I attended know. the meeting because I'm already thinking, like, I don't know how long I've gotten me to continue doing this. You know, things are getting harder. Things yeah. are progressing. And, you know, but then at the other end of it, like, I don't know how I will not do this. I wanted to mention, sometimes we can get very myopic too. Like I'll be super focused on something I need to do, like a stick of butter and, you know, and, and then some bread and a carton of milk and memorizing this as I walk into this UPS store to, to mail something. It was very important. Some doctors know they had to get, because I've been waiting for all my files to come in. I get all my medical records. And as I walk in, the woman's looking at me suspiciously. And I saw it in her eyes, the same look my dad used to have, same look my grandma had, same look my aunt had. She was very confused. She kept saying, why are you talking into your phone? What's going on? And I realized, oh, she has dementia starting or Alzheimer's and probably doesn't realize it. And she had just kept going and going. And she was so awful to me, but she made me cry, but not for me, for her. Her husband then got involved and kept apologizing to me, falling all over himself and said, it's okay. I think we both are struggling. She couldn't hear me very well. She was confused. She's trying to work and maybe she needs help too. And I just left. Because so I realized that I was so focused on me, 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 what I needed and what I need to come in with. And so I just want to say about disability, there are so many things that don't show that we all struggle with. And Kat had mentioned that before. Sometimes we get, I get so egoic, we get so egoic and not like, I got to get this done. It's about, you know, and then I realized, oh, everybody's got something. And now we can just see it a little better. I just wanted to add that into the mix. Thanks. And I, I wanted to mention, um, and, and I agree with Heather profoundly, because really, I think when we were going through grief here, when Lily was in dealing with her cancer, people would say, what can we do? I said, the best thing you can do is smile at the person who's grumpy and lying, because you don't know what's been set upon them or what they're having to deal with. And the last thing they need is somebody to pile on their grief. Just give them a nice smile. Just be kind. Um, but what I wanted to say about the whole social security and working thing uh, that Kat mentioned, um, I remember we did interviews uh, down at our social security board here in Nevada. Uh, and I was painstaking because I was teaching still. And I really didn't want this so much like Cat. I mean, I had the best career in the world. I was a high school teacher. I had kids who were winning national and state awards. They were making videos and as you said, fantastic program. And it waned down because I didn't have the energy and letting go of that was something I was never going to do. But reality hit. And that's the biggest thing is all of you who are saying you don't know when, you'll know when. You will know when and, and you'll address it then, but keep it as a conversation with those that are close with you uh, that you can have so they can help you see the when. Uh, and then even if you don't, you know, do like Amber is doing now and start going to social security meetings and start understanding it so you can navigate it when you get there because it is a tough thing to navigate, but it is navigated. Uh, it can be done. So that's my two cents. It's really complicating navigating. It's one of the more difficult topics. Social Security, Medicare. I mean, these things are really challenging. And, and you're sort of fraught with this, almost this uh, grieving and loss of your life and now having to all of a sudden deal with all these issues. It's really challenging for, for, for me. 
as in this journey so far, this dealing with the bureaucracy of of disability, plus physical the handling the physical components is probably the more challenging thing that I've experienced in the 14 years that I've had Parkinson's. Unfortunately, you're forced to deal with this really difficult, complicated navigation of, you know, meeting criteria and stuff at a time when you're sort of least able to do that. Right. Yes. To make a recommendation, you know, based on one of these conversations that we had a couple of years ago, one of the previous members directed me towards seeking professional counsel. This was Amy who actually said, Kevin, you need to get a lawyer right, and someone who can really guide you through this. And I will tell you, it's the best money I've ever spent because all these things of filling out forms and trying to figure out this intensive maze when you're emotionally distraught, my lawyer really helps me just calm down and say, that's just the way they are. We'll get through this. And and you're right about seeing someone. I forgot about that. We did that because it's a process that is very difficult when we have to let go of something. So the psycho psychologist really helped uh, gain perspective. And it, I think that's a huge plus, Kevin. I, I, I love that you added that. Yeah, I've got kind of a funny story about getting approved for uh, SSDI and uh, Social Security Disability. On this past April 6th, I was supposed to have a phone hearing in for, before a judge, and I was sweating it, primarily because my long-term disability insurance provider wanted me to apply for Social Security Disability Income. Ever since I had DBS, I've been doing a lot better. And I was worried the judge was going to reject me and that I was going to have a hard time dealing with my insurance provider. And then on March 31st, I break my leg. I'm sitting in ski patrol's office waiting for the shuttle to take me to the emergency department. My phone rings and it's my disability lawyer. And he tells me, we don't need to have the hearing. The judge has approved your claim. So it was kind of ironic that I'm worried about being flagged as non-disabled. I'm out skiing and I get approved. All right. That's enough of that story. But it's important to note that that uh, um, Social Security disability was put in place or came about long before there were computers and cell phones and that type of thing. So it was designed around a workforce that was more manual labor. So Right. All it the, doesn't all make the, sense. Yeah, all the information that you have to put into that is kind of based on how much you can lift, how much you can carry, how long you can stand, that kind of stuff, which few of us do in our jobs anymore. Most of our time, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a computer keyboard. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that are you disabled or are you not disabled? Well, by the old stoic viewpoint of SSDI, it was hard to look like you were disabled. But in the new world, today's new world, and I don't know if that's a new world or not, but in the, the world that we live in today, it's not necessarily based on all the manual things. And that's where I think uh, attorneys can really help that a lot. And your doctors can really help when you're making those applications to those things. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd also like to say that I um, thank you, everybody, for your kind comments. First off, I try to not fall apart here, but I also want to say that that for all that the system is difficult, I do feel very lucky to live in this country and be able to have yeah. some resources. Um, and, and I'm so well aware um, that that many parts of the world, people don't have the kind of resources that we have. So even though the system is not perfect, it is a system that allows us to have free speech. And, um, and while a lot of us may feel stigmatized or marginalized, we, in general, have a a world that we can be in without a lot of that. So I I, I don't want to minimize that people are around the world are suffering. And and I actually would love to hand off to Kev because I think he and I have been working on on some projects together. And I just want to share something, let him share something powerful about, and that helped give me some perspective. Um, 
Cat. Ginger Cat. I, I thank you for teeing that one up. Um, you know, I was thinking about this just last week when I was, they turned my DBS off so that I could get Botox. And I felt like I was having trouble swallowing, blinking, even breathing. But I mean, at that point in time, if you'd seen me, I was totally disabled. But what it led me to think about how lucky I am. I mean, here I am getting the state-of-the-art care, right? I mean, I, I, I drove to the hospital, part of the disabled lot, getting the best of DVS and best of Botox and medical care, and, and realizing that there are people around the world that have nothing. Right. I, have I have all these. <laughs> That's right. There's a project that several of us are working on in medication equity in developing countries like Africa. I mean, the stigmatization if you're in Africa is that you're possessed by the devil if you have Parkinson's. In some parts of Africa. That's true. Not in Colorado, in too. <laughs> uh, that, well, well, that's the point on here is that stigmatization <laughs> is in different <laughs> forms everywhere. We may not have it as extreme as, as in, in parts of Africa where people are literally pulled out of their homes and killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 there's a documentary that just showed on BBC called Shaking Hands with the Devil. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage everyone to watch this and we could come back and have a very different conversation here if people are willing and interested in doing it. But it really sort of level sets and puts in perspective. It really minimizes that. all of our complaints, right? It just makes us feel very humble. That's sure. right. And, mm -hmm. and we don't point out this documentary because we want you to feel bad about yourselves, because I think we all are a product of the cultures that we are born and raised in. And, and, I think what's been interesting doing this work with Kevin and and a, a, a group of international advocates is that that it, it's just enlightening because sometimes we sit, get to sit in our own homes and refill our prescriptions and and drive to the markets when you realize that other people in the world don't have those privileges and I think that it's humbling to think that 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 simply by being diagnosed with Parkinson's in some parts of the world, people put their lives at risk, letting that become public. And so it's a powerful, um, uh, it's a powerful watch. I think it's, it's great awareness for anybody to watch, but we don't, we're not saying it or bringing it up to, to make you all feel humbled or bad, or we're more bringing it up as an awareness point. And I think for me, it's, it, it's a, um, it's eye opening. It's humbling. It's also a touch point for me to remember my own relative privilege. I, I want to kind of veer back just a little bit um, because one aspect of disability um, that I know very well because I'm a veteran is veterans getting disability and getting Parkinson's in there. So just a quick moment on that because it's very difficult. But now that they've done this recognition of the toxic uh, exposure, um, uh, and the chemicals and all of that, they, they found two of the bases. My wife discovered that two of the bases I was at had TCE, tetrafluoroethylene, I think. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the drinking water. Um, but so here's the trick, and this might even work with some of the stuff you're doing with social security. We found out that if we could get a doctor or a researcher of Parkinson's to say that my exposure is as likely as not to have contributed to my Parkinson's, mm -hmm. at least in the VA sense of the government, as likely as not, they will go with, okay, that's good enough for us. So as some of you are navigating disability, I, I can't remember all the paperwork we did for that one with social security, but that's a very important phrase. And to have a doctor give that to you, it's called a nexus letter um, that can get you through. My wife was a genius. We did it in three years. We got hundred percent disability in three years. Normally that's like a 15 year process. But um, I just want well, to put that better out there. To know now that the, there's a PACT Act, so they can look up That's and it. get help through the PACT Act too. Yeah. P A C T. Yeah. P A C T. Yeah. Okay. It's a it's a really big um, thing for getting the veterans who've been exposed mainly during the recent wars, but it also works if you were at bases that had this stuff. 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention as I've been listening to all of you is, because we're talking about disabilities, we're talking about the sadness of it or the hardness of it. But Kevin has mentioned no barriers and I did no barriers warriors, which was the veterans aspect of it. But what I loved without going just into no barriers was when you look at them and their website and you start to see all these other links and all these other places that are doing things for people with disabilities, like doing fly fishing or uh, doing hiking. And it's like, there's just whole wide variety. And when you get into that world and you see people that they have disabilities like you that don't really show, you know, I've met people who were crushed by cars, but they can walk again, but it's, you know, tricky and dicey and they need the disability stuff. But when you're all together in this and you're lifting each other up to climb these poles and do the ropes course and get through the hike or get through the, it's like disability isn't the end of it. Disability is just another avenue. And, and that's is I, I just want to open that avenue up as we're looking at the disability. I don't want to have it just sadness. There's a whole lot of fun in the disability world. <laughs> Still to be had. You know, Brian, there was no sadness on that weekend. Yeah. That I, went. I mean, people were dancing to a deaf musician who could hear nothing. And we're all out there having a good time. Uh, I can't tell you how much joy comes from admission and trying to prop each other up. Um, I, I, have, I have one observation from the WPC that I wanted to chat about, and that's the cultural treatment of people with disability. What I noticed was when we were in Barcelona, every time I was on a bus or a train, someone got up and gave me their seat. I can't tell you how moved I was by that. And then they would offer Jen, my care provider, one because she was with me. And so I've tried to make it part of my world right now to do a something that I can do one-on-one -on -one with people now is just instead of getting on a bus and getting out your phone and starting to text, is just to look <laughs> around and see people that you can help. If you're just being a little aware and you teach your kids to do that, I mean, the world would be so much better if we if we treat our own disabled friends around as well. Wouldn't wouldn't the world be better if we all were just a little bit more aware and mindful about everything, right? Not not just about who may need help, but maybe be more present with the people we love, um, the people we care about, and um, I think that helps with gratitude, Doug. It's amazing you know, how I, I feel the same way. If I'm feeling, you know, crummy, I, I do feel like, like I can try to dial back and remember that, that, you know, electricity and internet connection and um, red lipstick are privileges. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I put it on. I was feeling a little I down. I love you. This <laughs> I just, also, you being know, makes all the Adding the impatience to that too, because so Kevin, as what you, what you're saying, so that people give give you their seats. But if you look, if you look like you don't need it, are they more as likely to do it? So I think that being patient with people that might not display that they have issues or have a disability or need need the seat at that time, I think that people should if we practice patience too mm -hmm. it'd be a nicer world yeah, yeah so we're approaching the end of our time and i think that's a great sentiment to to start to wrap up with because one thing that i think has permeated this conversation about about how do we move forward given changes that might occur and disabilities we might experience i i think central to all those things that that you have offered on the panel today is is a kind of calmness and 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 an open heartedness about the circumstances that you see. And I think that, uh, Christy, you're, you're spot on that I, I think it can be very helpful to have that for other people to approach other people with calmness, whether they're your family or your friends. And yeah, Brian, has you got something? And with a nice comment or a thought, when I was at the No Barriers thing and they're cheering me to go up the climbing wall and I was crying, thinking I can't do this, this is too hard. They're all chanting, you got this, you got this, Brian. We're right there with you. You can do this. And a month ago, I got put in a wheelchair because of this problem with my back. And the first thing I heard was, you got this, Brian. We're with you. And I had no sadness. I 
hardly talk about it in that sense now. You guys it's like a temporary that. thing, but that's a good thing that we have with our groups is we all lift each other. You got this. <laughs> you got, yeah, we it's all also got hard. It. It's also hard. So I just went through the same thing and I had surgery. I'm with you. It's going to be easy. You'll, you'll fly through it. Well, that's what we do. Why that's, are we going to make everybody yeah. else's life easy, more difficult? Why not make it easier and just be kind and be nice to everybody? And listen to their stories. Yes. Listen to other stories. Everybody has something to teach you if you just listen. And to those those of you out there that if there's any way we can help you, I know on behalf of myself and all all these all the folks on the on the meetup here and the rest of the ambassadors, we're here to help. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. You can usually find us on the web page, dpf.org. Look under resources. Yeah, and on that note, we'll we'll po we'll post the links to the ambassador search on the on the follow up post that'll come out um, you know by the end of next week and. Uh, you know, thanks so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing everybody next week, or I'm sorry, next month, uh, third Thursday, we we meet and we hope to see you then. Uh, thanks for joining us and thanks to the panelists for being here today. You, you rule. You got this, Brian. <laughs> you all are great. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, guys. See you guys. Bye. Bye.